Hey folks, this is Andy Black. I'm the head brewer of Yorkshire Square Brewery in Torrance, California. Uh, the best British style brewery between Torrance Boulevard and Gracie Avenue. And I'm gonna show you how to make some cask ale today. All you're doing is interlocking the casks so they don't roll away. So the chime or the rim of each cask is then is around the rounded middle part uh, or the belly of the cask and that way they stay together and won't just roll away if you, you accidentally hit them. So sanitizing, these are already cleaned. Um, we'll keep them in storage. We've already put in our keystone. Keystone goes in here, shive, which we'll show later, goes in there. These are two kinds of keystones. It's a standard plastic keystone that we use normally. And this is what's called a thermoplastic keystone which is uh, meant for if you clean these like really, really hot, you put that in there and then it expands under the heat. But they're a little bit grippier than the plastic ones, but because we primarily don't um, prime the casks, then we, so they're under a lower pressure, we usually use these because it saves a little bit of money. This is a, this is a shive called a C-band shive. Um, it's a more expensive type, but they hold a really great seal. It's a nice like rubber ring right here. When all of these parts are considered disposable, you should not be saving them. Once we fill it, we'll hammer this into the top and it'll seal it up. So I just put a 500 milliliters in there, roughly. Super simple. So the cask isn't fully ready yet at this point. We still need to add biofine to it, so a fining agent, and we need a CO2 purge it. So because this cask is gonna be destined for a beer engine, we're not gonna add priming sugar. If we were to add priming sugar, we would add that with the biofine, then CO2 purge a cask, then fill it. And the same with any um, additions we might make, like dry hops or any of that other weird crap that you put in beer. All right, so we have our cask sanitized. Uh, we have our weave set up. We have all the shives in place just in case there's any dust going on in the, uh, in the building. Um, I'm gonna put some biofine in there. Silica gel uh, fining agent. Some people will use gelatin or they'll use isinglass. Uh, those are all common. They're totally suitable. We prefer silica gel um, because we use it in all of our beer. And we use Biofine Clear at a rate of 128 milliliters per barrel. So for a pin, that works down to 22 milliliters. We keep that pretty consistent across most beers. Um, if there's a higher yeast load or you have a different kind of yeast than we do, we use Y yeast 1469, which flocculates pretty well. We haven't seen a need to change that rate. We're going to throw the biofine in. In there. Simple. All right, and then we're gonna CO2 purge the cast. Now on CO2 purging, from a traditional standpoint, you wouldn't do this with the assumption that there's CO2 gonna break out of the beer, which will push all the air out. As we know from uh, counter pressure bottle filling and all kinds of things, that doesn't really hold true. And there's even less CO2 in this beer uh, to begin with. You're not gonna see that. So if you wanna get incredibly traditional cask flavor, like um, say you're brewing a bitter or a pale mild or something like that, I recommend not CO2 purging the cask. We don't do that for our bitter. Um, and you get a more, call it like an authentic flavor. It's kind of hard to describe. The slight amount of oxidation that you pick up through that process is actually positive to some beer styles. So we'll intentionally introduce oxygen that way. And it kind of makes up for what you'll see later in the line, but we do a, more of a closed pouring method, which means that there's gonna be less oxygen pickup in the beer at the cellaring stage. So if we introduce a little bit of oxygen now, it, we're gonna be able to pick up that cellar flavor here rather than there, and it's more controlled here than in the cellar. So our simple setup, we just have a quick disconnect over to our bulk CO2 tank. We have a short open-ended hose on a quick disconnect. The CO2 set at like 30 PSI on a high flow regulator. So it's gonna push the air out there. You could have an on-off valve, we just haven't introduced it yet. And we just hold that in there for a couple of seconds. Take it out, try it back. So that's not gonna be a perfect purge of oxygen, but it's better than doing nothing. And our, we've done back-to-back -back testing and it is a substantial difference. It's worth doing it if you wanna preserve more of your hot flavor and get 
not necessarily a cleaner representation of the beer that you get before because the way we serve it on Beer Engine is going to be a substantial flavor change, but you get probably a bit more hot brightness. It's less wetted into the hole of the beer. So the beer that we're going to be packaging is our American Brown Ale that's dry hopped and pretty substantially whirlpool hopped. So we want to preserve a little bit more hop character and make it less muddy because we've already got so much malt going on in this beer. So as such, we're going to CO2 purge. To go on to our setup and the way we have the tank set up in preparation for casking, this beer's finished fermenting. It's done a full diacetyl rest. It's gone through its full dry hopping cycle and the tank has been crashed. Ideally, we're packaging for cask um, after the tank has been sitting under refrigeration for about 48 hours to drop the yeast load as low as we can. Another way to do it is right before you transfer over to Bright Tank, um, as long as the beer is cool, you could cask at that point as well. But you want to have the beer as, a, a, as low a carbonation level as you can do um, without decarbing it in order to package for cask because too much carbonation going in there, it's either going to blow up or it's not going to pour well. This tank is currently crashing. Because we're going to transfer this beer eventually, we have it under top pressure. Pretty minimal, but not so much as to carbonate the beer, but not so little as when we fill our cask that we're going to um, create a vacuum in the tank. We want a little bit of top pressure so we don't have any air going into the tank. When we're going to cask a full amount out of a tank, we'll just open up the, um, the blow off arm and let air come in through the top because we have a yeast cake still sitting at the top of the type of yeast we have that will protect it from oxygen pickup. And it just makes it easier, you use a lot less CO2 and cask is kind of about using less CO2 anyway. So we'll use as little as possible when we can. But for this purpose, we want top pressure because this will go to bright. The cask setup is very simple and similar to simpler forms of yeast racking. Um, there's two different ways that you could do it. So similar to our CO2 hose, you could just use a simple open-ended and connect it to your racking arm and just use this valve. What we prefer to do, because we're usually running so many casts and we want to reduce loss, we double valve it. So we just have one of our hoses that we would use for kegging connected onto an armature that we've made. So the simple um, three quarter inch vinyl hose onto barb fittings, elbow, and then our second valve. And then this is a somewhat custom piece. I wouldn't call it sophisticated though. It's what's um, just called a tri-clamp spool. Uh, this would have come with another tri-clamp end on it. All I did was cut it off uh, and polish the inside and outside. Very simple. You can cut it for different lengths of cast, but we just tend to use it for everything. So we're hooked up to our racking arm, and now what we need to do is purge out the sanitizer, any air, um, et cetera, that's built up in the line. We'll just aim that towards the drain. You want to get as much yeast out of there, if there's any yeast built up, as you can. So you can get a cl as clear a beer going into the cask as possible. As long as the tank hasn't been fined or it been, hasn't been sitting for four weeks or something, there'll be plenty of yeast in there if you are planning on priming for uh, gravity service. We'll give our spool another spray of sanitizer. Chive right in. All the way down to the bottom, you don't want it like that because um, you might cause impingement on the outlet and you'll cause a more turbulent flow than you want. You kind of want to keep it as gentle as possible. And so now we're filling. And this will fill pretty quickly because we're under pressure and it's obviously a pin. All right, so you'll let it overflow until the foam stops. Back it up. You typically have enough in the tube to fill the head space. You know, it's kind of a similar concept to cap on foam. You don't really need to be crazy about trying to fill it all the way to the very top. You usually just end up wasting beer that way at some point in the process. You don't want a huge headspace, but just wait for all that foam to disappear. So, solid taps. We use, a, call it an inertia mallet or a weighted mallet. We use a 45 ounce that we bought from Lowe's. That's done. If you did add priming sugar at this stage, after we roll it around, you would just 
you know, park it in a uh, stable temperature area of the, of the brewery, preferably on a sloping floor in case you overprimed or got your uh, residual sugar in your beer incorrect, but um, then you'd store it now. But we're gonna take it for a walk and then move it to the cold box. So those rails on a cask mean they're meant to be rolled and it's the best way of distributing the finding agent in the cask. The filling of the cask should mean that you get uh, a nice mix, but this, this ensures it. Depending on the beer, if it's a really, if it's something we make a lot of that's really well suited to cask, like our English pale ale or our bitter, it'll sit in here for two to three days before going on service. This will probably sit in here for a week. Everybody's process of moving to Bright and transferring beers over is very different, but um, the way we do it, and I've been it, done it at other breweries, is you pull it in between. So you can pull it while it's crashing, even if you're gonna serve it on beer engine, it's just that high yeast load is really uh, concerning. You can deal with it. You really don't wanna to have too much yeast in there. You're gonna have beer clarity issues and clarity with casks should be paramount. You know, it's not a be all end all where you can't have a slightly hazier cask. There's a trend of using less findings in casks uh, that's going on in England. That's fine, but still, there's a flavor when you have a lot of yeast in there. You don't want a yeasty beer unless it's supposed to be that way. I, I don't think the alcohol matters so much as what are you intending to get out of that hot profile. You're not gonna get the same juice. It probably would come out tasting like um, a hazy IPA after a couple weeks, um, where it's gonna be a little bit. The hop profile doesn't have as many sharp edges to it, it's not like, orange juice and grapefruit zest. It's gonna be a bit more, the edges are gonna be rounded off of everything. Like we'll taste a beer that we have it on draft, that we have on draft and on, um, on cask and you'll be able to see that difference because it's a one and a half pound per barrel dry hop pale ale and you can really substantially tell the difference between uh, how that hop profile changes. Uh, I like cask because there's nothing else like it. It is one of the few sublime beer experiences left in this kind of jaded world of hazy IPA and all kegs kind of being the same and you know, go out and have a night and all the beer from bar A to bar Z, you know, you, you drink, if you drink X keg beer and all those bars, the only difference might be bar F didn't clean its lines, or bar C had great glassware and a good atmosphere. Cask is gonna be different all the time. Even from cask to cask within our own place, within our own system, we see changes. And that's not from, I would like to think, not from lack of skill on our end or inconsistency on our end. It's that the beer just has an opportunity to change and be different. It's not the, the cask is a living organism, I think is a little bit overblown but you just have subtle temperature changes from here to there, and it really lets a beer kind of be its own thing and shine on its own. And it really bumps, it takes small beers and makes them more, and takes bigger beers and brings them down, but makes them more, you, you can sit there and like really kind of ponder it more than you do with a keg beer where it's all bright and fizzy and kind of in your face. It's just, it's so different from what keg delivers. Keg is such a, like a straight and narrow process. So just trying to replicate exactly what you get in the tank as what you get in the glass. And there's a certain consistency of the flavor profile then, but you don't get to introduce any magic there. Keg just doesn't have the opportunity for magic the way cask does. So cask is so much more holistically involved of the whole brewing process, the brewer, makes the beer and then just kind of releases it out into the world and the barmen, the bar people at the, at the pub kind of do with it what they will. If they mess up the beer, they actually have every opportunity to mess up the beer. It's not like dirty lines. It's like the cask can be infected and totally fucked up uh, in all kinds of ways, which colors some people's beer experiences where they'll have a really bad cask and it's not until they have that sublime cask that's been really well cared for and really well made and served just so that they're like the lights go off and they realize that you can have a sublime experience with this.